Welcome back to House of a Thousand Books, your monthly horror book podcast, where this month we are reading We Need to Do Something by Max Booth III. I'm one of your hosts, Brody. Alongside me is... Hi, I'm Gabby. Hey, I'm Steph. Hi, I'm Dan. And I am Steven or SJ, whichever you prefer. Thanks for joining us tonight for another edition of House of a Thousand Books. This was a weird one. And I'm real excited to discuss. Um, we're going to start off with kind of spoiler-free reactions, thoughts, feelings. Although this is going to be a hard one to discuss without spoilers because I feel like the less you know about it, the better. So honestly, I would recommend stopping right now and picking up this book and reading. But we're going to do a light, brief summary that is spoiler-free. And then we will warn you guys when we're really going to get into it so you can sign off. Go read and then come back and listen to us. But Dan, take it away with our summary. All right. So We Need to Do Something is about a dysfunctional family that locks themselves inside their home bathroom to avoid a harsh storm that they believe to potentially be an EF5 level tornado. And as the storm starts getting worse, the younger brother and the mother they try to pass some time by playing games while the daughter and the father start to freak out and the lights go out. And so the father uses the daughter's phone to see what's going on outside the door. And they notice that they're trapped in there by a fallen tree that's blocking the door from the outside. And in the chaos of this downpour freak out moment, he accidentally drops her phone outside. So now they're trapped in this bathroom and it soon becomes evident that there is something terribly wrong here and enough time has passed to where no neighbors have come to check up on them. So it's either the neighbors are all dead or they're already evacuated, leaving this family behind. So what horrors lie in store for this family trapped in a small bathroom with no food or help in sight? Reed, we need to do something to find out. That's a good pitch. Yeah. So my first question for everyone is how did you read the story? Was it ebook, physical? Did you do an audio experience? How did everyone take in the story? I bought a physical copy. Nice. I listened uh, via audio because this is actually free on Spotify. So unless you're on a family easy. plan, <laughs> unless you're on a family plan, it's also free on YouTube, posted by the author himself. So I did listen to that while periodically reading uh, digitally along with the audio. So mm. I did pure ebook via Libby. Shout out Libby. Yeah. We love Libby. Sponsor us. Actually gatekeep Libby because we need the holds. <laughs> True. <laughs> Those holds be long. Yeah, I started doing just ebook version and then Daniel put me on, told me that the author released the audiobook on his podcast so i started doing an in tandem experience and highly recommend and of course the author of publishing it was really fucking cool if you listen to the entire podcast episode not just the audiobook he like has a little intro to it and he said some really really cool stuff especially just about publishing the book and why he was choosing to release the audiobook version and like fully acknowledged he was like i don't need to be doing this like i could be forcing you to buy it and pay like pay me for it but I recognize that's not sustainable and accessible for everyone so I've I chose to release my work here for free and he was like if you loved it I definitely wouldn't mind you like buying a physical copy after so I definitely think I'm gonna go order one because I loved it (laughs) oh I need to have it I also feel like because it's so short if you get it physically you can kind of loan it out it's like easy to maybe introduce someone to the physical copy how many pages is it so it's um it's a it's around 152 I think pages and then I thought it was 168 but the there's an afterward I never read those things um but I'm really glad I did because it really made me appreciate it more and um shout out Max Booth cool dude owns a bookstore in uh, Texas that's just like all horror and also publishes indie horror books mm. um and is a writer too so he's cool um. And I'll get in, I'll, I'll talk about it after because I feel like the way, I don't know, it just makes sense to talk about it later. I totally meant to read it. I put the bookmark on the ebook to come back to it and I just never had time. So I'm still going to do it maybe tonight before I go to bed. But this book creeped me out. I don't know if I want to read it before bed. 
But yeah, he has a pretty extensive backlist. I don't know how old he is, not to be ageist, but he feels young, at least his writing and the sound of his voice, if that can tell someone's age. So I would assume he's not much older than any of us. And he has a quite extensive backlist of publications out. Based on his Instagram, he looks relatively young. I would say like maybe 30s. Yeah, I think his uh, his author picture is somewhere too, and he looked young. His... <laughs> I was just going on Goodreads to see some reviews for Inspo, and his bio on Goodreads is Max Booth the Third does not exist, and neither do you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, that's very funny. So I was a little intrigued. Well, I will just say, um, if you haven't read it, I just go in not knowing anything. Don't try to figure it out. I feel like that's the best way. I do have something to say that just popped in my head. Um, we are only discussing the book. There is a film adaptation that was obviously released after the book release. I was trying to find like some conspiracy theories or like just some conversations about the book on like Reddit or whatever. And I could not, like every time I searched the book title and the author's name and like discussion, it only defaulted to the movie. So either no one's talking about the book or like the algorithm just pushed the book discussion down because the movie came out after. But People are talking about the movie. None of us here have seen it yet. We might do a group watch of it if time permits. So there might be a little bonus content of us maybe comparing. But this conversation is strictly the story, not the movie, which Max Booth III wrote the screenplay for. Oh, multi-talented. Yeah, I will say too, because it says it in the afterward that he actually first wrote the story for the first time as a screenplay. Oh, so wait. Wow. And then turned it into a novella and then back into a screenplay with new elements that he added. My note here, the first thing I wrote down was Eric LaRocca meets Ian Reed. Mm. Yeah. That's the baby. I did get very Ian Reed vibes as a big Ian Reed <laughs> fan. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Like, I feel like it went, it had the ambiguity of a good Ian Reed story. For those of you who aren't familiar, Ian Reed wrote, um we, we spread. spread we spread what's the color? i'm thinking of ending I'm thinking things of ending things Faux. 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 Oh, yeah. so like if you're not familiar with his work very ambiguous but it's like a little bit more tame so he has like the shock value and i'll go there aspect that eric laroca has with the high concept ambiguity what is happening is this even real vibes that ian reed does so well so those are two of my favorite horror authors to be honest and i think max booth earned a place up there right next to them for me personally i know so if that didn't sell you go read this book and come back you're back <laughs> you're back <laughs> <laughs> well, how was it <laughs> <laughs> we want your thoughts that's what this whole podcast is about call in all right Guys, this book was fucking crazy. <laughs> Holy shit. Yes. How many times did I go, oh no? <laughs> <laughs> and the emotional whiplash. Ooh. Okay. I have a thousand questions written down. Okay, let's do it. I have a good first question, I think. What is up with Bobby and his sister's ass? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the men in this book were in sufferable Both yeah i'll be you know what let's be let's just say this right now none of the characters were likable no oh oh my god i hated every single one of them literally and i need bobby to die like page two i don't know why he stuck around like he was so <laughs> annoying so annoying i would just as a pre disclaimer this book was extremely triggering <laughs> i <laughs> I had visceral hate reactions to reading the father's lines. I took notes, the Kindle app, for anyone who's never used it, you could insert notes as you read, which I did not know. So I took a ton of notes because I was like trigger happy putting notes in. And every time the dad spoke or the daughter like shared a sentiment about her father, I just wrote, did I write this? And then <laughs> I searched at the end of how many times I did that. And there's like 18 where I read that line. <laughs> and it's like, how... Did I come up with that sentence about this despicable man? So I have a lot to say about the father if we want to <laughs> start tearing these people apart. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the father? I mean, he's the worst person I've ever met in my entire life. And 
immediately. There's no warm up to it. Yeah. Immediate. Like the worst person you'd want to be trapped in a room with. Well, I just kept saying, like, what would I do in this situation? Like, and that thought was just in my head the whole time. If I was trapped in this fan, no offense, Daniel, but if I was trapped with my family <laughs> in close quarters like that, I would end it so fast. No, I was like, because because when you're reading it, you feel like you're trapped in there with them, which is why I personally think the book would be better than the movie, in my opinion. I haven't seen it yet, but um, all I was thinking was like, there, like, there has to be a window. Like, I would be out of there. I don't know. I just... Not to like get out and survive. I just would not be able to be around these people. All three of them. I mean, even the daughter too. Just every one of them. I could not. Ugh. Yeah. So the father is like your basic, not only your basic, he's your extreme toxic white alcoholic. Alcoholic father. father. <laughs> he's like the, like, he's a character. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? He's just going to the bowling alley. He's a really good bowler. Do you know how long it took me to... F- I noted the exact moment when I figured out the bowling alley was a euphemism for the bar. Well, you can drink at bowling alleys, too. Yeah, you can drink at bowling. There's, like, bars at bowling alleys. There's bars. I just automatically... I was like, yeah, he's going to drink, no matter what. Like, I, I guess, yeah. I guess so. But every time he's like, oh, he stayed out late at the bowling alley last night, I was like, oh. Oh, but that is true. One of the first interactions or introductions about the father we get is our narrator who remains nameless all the characters remain nameless for a good chunk of the story did you guys pick up on that too wait do they ever get names i don't remember they do they do they do the writing style was brilliant like brilliant all the characters remained nameless up until they didn't like it was like the mom would just call the daughter's name and we'd be like oh okay well that's melissa or mel right like no introduction they would just like hard drop the names i thought that was genius just to continue this feeling of confusion and like nothing is real but everything is real at the same time it's also in the point of view of mel so like she doesn't think of them by their first names totally it's mom dad and bobby fucking bobby yeah but like going back to just the author's writing like the first line of the story our phones won't stop screaming yeah chills oh fuck we're in for a ride here (laughs) it was he's just a brilliant writer truly there's so many moments just highlighting beautiful writing throughout this whole entire book. Yeah. But kind of going back to the dad, I got a little derailed there. One of the first sentiments the daughter shares about him, we immediately figure out he's toxic because he talks about how his mom, the grandmother, said um, freckles were N-word babies, but instead he actually used the real word. And of course, dad thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Thank God for cancer. Mm-hmm. And then that was my first did I write this? <laughs> <laughs> also, how immediately the ritual is hinted to, or not even the ritual yet. It's something happened, right? The mom notices she's bleeding when they first get in the bathroom. And then she says, yeah, it happened when I was at Amy's house, whatever, her friend, questionably girlfriend. And she says, yeah, there was a moment earlier tonight when I thought it would never stop bleeding. And I just wrote, no more context and the author did not clue us in for a long time on what that was referencing and i thought that was also genius just withholding all this information from us because honestly in that moment it's not really relevant for so much of the book you're i I was personally like the only thing i wanted to know is what she did because it kept alluding to this thing that she did and it's so like perfect to keep you going and it's good payoff and the way she was talking about it like it, it was life or death just like she made it such a big deal but then never told us it was the way she reacted when her dad dropped her phone was like not like your typical like just annoyed that like her phone's lost like she was catastrophically upset that she didn't have her phone in order for her friend to contact her yeah how did you just feel like having her as our narrator because she was extremely unreliable right from the beginning do you enjoy reading from an unreliable pov i think she is unreliable in her character and keeping these secrets and stuff but also as we get toward the end of (laughs) the hallucinations the drugs all that that adds a layer of unreliable so it's all like what i expected and what it's not that i didn't like it it was like ah just give me answers well, even in the very beginning, page 15, she says, like, none of this can be real. So there's already a point in the very beginning where she alludes to, like, time 
or just the question of reality and whatnot. I thought that that was really smart throughout the book. The books that I always love the most are like unreliable narrators. I love like, I don't know, I feel like this book, you kind of see a descent into like, like madness a little bit, which that's like one of my favorite tropes to read for some reason. <laughs> I'm the same way, Brody. I think I think it's the psychology in us, the psychology background in us. We just like to see, because I'm the same way, because I feel like I just got to like see her like lose herself more. I mean, we essentially saw her, we like experienced her entire family, like just losing it closer to closer. I, so I liked that part. Yeah, I love just like going into those because I feel like once they start and you realize kind of what's going on, I like to just like, I'm just like, okay, nothing, everything's going to happen and like, it's going to be insane, but like, it's going to make sense. Like, you know what I mean? Like you have to just like lose yourself in it kind of, because I feel like some people try to go into it, like trying to make logical sense of everything. And like, there's not a lot of logic or sense in it. Mm. Yeah. Because of the length, there wasn't a lot of time to get to know anyone. It's kind of just like a cold open. Here's our narrator. And we're taking in this experience through her lens. So I just, I mean, really didn't trust her, one. And two, could not like place how old she was. She felt so childlike to me. She was very like naive, very gullible. Like her fa- her little brother was like, it's a fire tornado. And she was like, oh my God, a fire tornado. And they're like, those don't exist. And I, was I like, thought that was hmm. weird. She's five. I couldn't like figure, but she was attached to her cell phone and like this girl. So I was like, maybe she's, high schooler I could not figure it out and again the author didn't confirm anything that happened to me with Bobby honestly just some like some stuff he said was literally toddler and then some I was like he's like 10 (laughs) I don't know I was like what the heck like what kid acts like this like either he was too immature or like weirdly smart at times I don't know it was weird yeah I feel like she read a lot younger for the book but um I don't know. I feel like it's an interesting thing to uh, Steph psychology. Um, the parents like raising style of the kids, like they probably would be more mm. mature. I feel like if that makes sense. So, or we'll say the mom's raising cause. <laughs> yeah. And then just the, the home life, I guess, cause they're still around the father. True. I couldn't gauge their age. <laughs> it made no sense. Uh, I mean, Dan, you kind of just brought what you said I kind of, he felt young at some times, then he felt weirdly mature at other times. It got me thinking, because that's what I felt with her. I felt like she was so gullible and so naive. And then she was really adult. And maybe, and here's me just theorizing, a lot of the concept of the book played with time, I think, and I have a couple of theories about. So maybe that was to further like push that narrative, right? Like time doesn't matter. They could be young, they could be old. Like time does not exist. At least that's my theory. So Maybe that was like a plot device for the author to push that a little bit. Well, yeah. I mean, we learn about Spot the dog Mm. and apparently he passed away. He's in the backyard. And then periodically throughout the story, we, we, he's there, he's alive. He's, he's licking their hands. He's licking their hands. Uh. So like, yeah, that whole point of like, is, was he dead? Was he not? Is this a flashback? Is this a hallucination? Is Spot, was Spot always alive? Like, What's interesting is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they buried him by a tree in their backyard. So is the tree not the thing holding them in the door? So is it like the tree up uprooted this ground and like whatever supernatural thing caused it to fall also caused him to resurrect? I don't know. I thought it was going to be... Did the dog break the tree? Big question. <laughs> was that the dog? Was it the dog? Can we talk about that scene? Because that was like hands down my my favorite scene in the entire book. Okay. Do you guys know creepy pasta? Yes. yes. Oh my God, that's what I was gonna say. Mm-hmm. The fucking the human lick. I thought it was the that. human lick. Oh my God, I my skin crawled. I really thought it was that, or I thought it was like the devil or something. That was just disgusting. I texted Gabby. I said the book scared me, and it was that. What page is it? Um, it's <laughs> seventy six. Dude, that was. The coolest the fucking part. I need to write a note because it was so funny. Can can we have a quick summary of this uh moment that you're talking about, friends? Because <laughs> I don't really remember. <laughs> yeah, so they're like, I mean, we're we're kind of getting a little sporadic, but obviously this family's locked in the bathroom, right? They're there for an 
undisclosed amount of time. There's no windows that all their phones are either outside or dead. And time is just going. And basically they're just being toxic. They're just fighting and talk, like bringing up the past and just like realizing that they are all really scared of the father. He is super, he's a ticking time bomb. He's toxic as hell. He is full of rage and just they're afraid of him. So a lot of weird shit happens. When I first started reading the story, I was like, okay, here's, I, I'm not going to really try and play detective here, but I'm like, I assume it's going to be this broken family who all hate each other, get trapped in close quarters and like this horrific real life situation and are forced to like rehash and process their trauma and like rekindle their relationships. And I was like, okay, and then maybe the dad might murder one of his family members and that'll be like the horror. But then it went in a such other direction that everything just became hella questionable. You weren't even sure if the bathroom was real, if the tornado was real, if they're the only humans left on this planet. So a lot of just weird shit happens. But ultimately, after some time in the bathroom, they hear barking outside, right? And the little brother like freaks out. And he's like, that's the dog. I knew you all fucking lied to me. And I knew he was still alive. And Wait, does it bark? Something happens that they know that they it's, think it's I don't think it's a bark. It's, it's sniffing. It's sniffing. Is it the s- unknown oh, begins to sniff? Wait. Oh, it's a dog. I think it's a dog, I whisper on page 54. We can't see a thing. It can't be human. It has to be an animal then. Nothing too big. Its footsteps aren't heavy enough to justify it a justify a deer. I think it's a dog, I whisper. The sound of my voice excites whatever's at the door. Now it's making noise, whining, pawing at the wood, begging to be let It inside. never says bark. It doesn't bark. No, but then I highlight it because Bobby runs over and like, immediately sticks his hand through the door because, and I quote, nothing gets between him and dogs. He would walk through fire if it meant getting to rub a dog's belly afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is for real. <laughs> And he's having so much fun. He's licking my hand, you guys. It likes me. It loves me. And I put the note in, oh, no. <laughs> because that I only one thing was going to happen. And I, was, and I was correct. The turn, the turn was when the dog says back, I'm a good boy. That's the... Oh, my God. <laughs> I wrote... <laughs> my comment is, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. That actually scared me. <laughs> Because the audiobook was so scary. <laughs> oh, shit. The audiobook, too. Yeah. Oh, I didn't listen to it. Was it a different voice when it did it? Like, she, did, it was a female narrator. She just, like, lowered her voice and said, I'm... It was, like, deeper. Now you know how it feels. It, it, was your, it was your weight of blood moment, for sure. My also question is, like, how long do you think they were in there? Let's pretend, like, this is a real-life situation. They are stuck in a tornado, and they're locked in this bathroom, right? How long are they in there? Because they have no sense of time. They made that very clear. There's no windows. They can't see out well enough out of the bathroom, like the little crack that is there. Their phones died. Our narrator's phone is outside. It's not dead. It's just on the other side of the door. And they're just like guessing. Like They're like, mom, how long have we been here? I don't know, a day or two, right? Like They have no idea. And then when the daughter does get back her phone, which I'm not actually, I don't remember how that happens, but eventually she does get her phone back. He just reaches out after a while and then finds it. And basically. it's still on. So the yeah. bat has not died. So it has not been long enough for her phone to die. Maybe like a day? Unless she just, it could have all been a delusion. Maybe she hallucinated the phone being on. Yeah, because there's no way they're getting feral and eating tongues after like a day. And if I got my phone back, I would see like, I don't know. I would be like, what day is it? But also, like, you know, what I also thought about that afterwards was like, you know, they say that you can kind of like phone the dead to like talk to the other side kind of situation. Ooh. You know, like a ghost telephone was always a big thing. And like, you know, the only person I think they talked to on that phone was Amy, who thinks she's dead and ultimately maybe died mm-hmm. before wow. this one book started. So was the phone still on? Was it ever on? Ooh, I never thought was it was a medium. Good point. Oh my god, that's crazy. Yeah, well, is this jumping ahead too much? Because then the dad gets a call on it too, right? Well, the dad answers. Answers, right. And we don't know what that was, but it couldn't have been anything real. 
Well, can we actually go back? Because we keep talking about Amy, but I don't think we ever said who that oh. was. Mm. Amy. <laughs> Amy is, I'm pretty, I, 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 I want to say, like, pretty confidently Amy was, like, the love interest of the main character. And she, al- I, she always claimed to, like, have this thing inside of her, and it, like, is, like, this bad thing inside of her, and she needs to, like, get rid of it. So they perform like a ritual together to get rid of this thing that she claims that she has. Well, the first time they do a ritual, it was to spite that boy that was talking shit. Yeah, and was like talking them. mm -hmm, Except they used the wrong animal and accidentally killed him. Yeah. And is that when the dad was like, the dad's like, you can't choke on your own tongue. Yeah, I feel like that's debatable too, though, because it's like I don't, we don't know anything about the magic or anything, so we don't know if that was. Oh, it was just a coincidence. Also, if you know, right, yeah, that's and the crazy and, part, right, and also like if there is this other entity within Amy that she claims, it's like could that have actually taken control of the spell somehow and killed and made it like worse, killed the kid? I don't know. And so, like the main character is taking like responsibility. She thinks like this whole thing that's happening with her and her family is all her fault. Mm. as a result to the thing that her and her friend did together and she like struggles with like throughout the story like if she like should say anything and tell her family what happened my kind of going back to time and I guess I need to learn that time doesn't exist in this book so I need to stop being so hung up on it but I took the note down well first I was like she's so codependent on Amy and again going back to that naive childlike behavior she's like eats her like she doesn't even care that the world's ending all she wants is her phone and she wants to call her and she wants to talk to her right and I literally was just like she's so codependent on this girl but then I wrote are like how long did they know each other for when we get the backstory it made it seem like they just met one off one day yeah Mm -hmm. it really does she was in love with her and then they did this ritual like I wrote down like they're in a relationship but they barely know each other I totally agree I totally agree with that. Because time isn't real. Or is Amy real? Yeah, we can't trust her. The narrator, I mean. Because of the question of time and like, that I started thinking like, is this in a loop? Have they just always been? Do you know guys, mm-hmm. do you guys know the um the play No Exit? It's like a French play or whatever. We had to read it. Or um A Good Place, if you don't know that. it's. It, I thought that they were each other's hells. Mm-hmm. so I was like okay they're gonna be forever stuck in this bathroom so that ending scared the fuck out of me that I is like, okay, hell, no one's honestly. gonna die yeah I thought that I was like okay so they're just there to kind of torture each other so mm. I I just assumed that like at that point that there was no time space whatever they were just in a vacuum it felt like a totally different reality I feel like you were all thinking big brain when you read and I was just reading it <laughs> <laughs> as literal like I was like okay they've been trapped so they're going crazy so I was just writing everything off as like they're delusional they're hallucinating they're making this up but like wow well I also like the idea of just buying into it completely and right, that right. she did do the ritual and she's like a witch or whatever and like right. she did cause the ending of the world I love that idea too I love seeing it in different aspects mm. very bunny <laughs> <laughs> always comes back to me not to give the dad any credit because fuck him but he was even playing up this idea right because he was then getting in my head being like well this probably is the end of the world we're probably the only people alive because we have neighbors someone would have come checked on us they would clearly see a tree fall on this point and we don't hear anything there's no one there's no sirens we could hear outside i don't hear no one screaming no one screaming for help it sounds dead silent out there this was probably it like we're probably the only people left and I was like, fuck. Now I'm questioning if this is real or not. This is a little later, but you know what got me with that is when he called out the mom and he was like, where's your boyfriend at? Would he not have come and heard that you weren't gone for a couple of days? I was like, wait, no one's showing up. Why is there a dog outside? Like all this stuff, it has to be supernatural. It's not just like, I can't take it literal. When do you hear the person on the other side of the door and the guns or whatever? Uh, that's that was so confusing. Yeah, that was that confused me the most. I think because I feel like that happens after the dog stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes, 
when they when she rips the guy's tongue out, which we actually that never was so the cool. a hunter of tongues. I highlighted that. I was like, that is such a cool ass title. <laughs> I did not expect her to be the only one to get it and keep it down. That was a little moment. Also, they everyone except the dad accepted the fact that they were gonna eat this thing's tongue so fast like the mom was like yeah you're right we have to." like not just like you know how like people eat tongues like cooked tongues and stuff but like it's like a yeah. unknown dirty slobbery dog and like you just ripped it out with your bare hands I'm like, absolutely and not raw yeah oh the second she ripped it out and she was just holding the tongue and they made the reference she says like a tongue on a tongue and in my gut i knew what was coming i literally wrote down I fucking knew it when she says, if we don't eat something soon, we're going to die. And I yeah. said, I didn't want to say it out loud or even put the note in, but in the off chance that I was correct. <laughs> and I fucking was. And I was almost mad at myself for thinking it, but I'm more mad at Max the <laughs> third for writing it. Wouldn't it have been so funny if after that, they look and they were like, we were in there for an hour. And we ate a <laughs> for nothing. 10 minutes went by. Also, did you think the dog was coming back? Cause like she was like, and I wrote this down because I was like Cujo, <laughs> where she like takes the tongue and it runs away to whatever, and she's like, I feel it. I a part of me wonders if it's still nearby, waiting, watching, smelling. And I was like, <laughs> it's gonna come back. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised it didn't. Yeah. Well, it also said weird choice of words. It said it ran back up the tree. Yeah. Oh, because the tree would be in their house so like it's like a random it didn't run away it didn't run out of the house it didn't run upstairs it ran back up the tree hmm. so as if it came from up the tree so is the now i picture the tree like upright like growing out of the bedroom i wanted to go back real quick to what i was saying before about this codependent relationship um i was getting so mad at the daughter for how codependent she was on amy and I literally just, I, I wrote down like priorities, girl, because that's all like your, your family's dying. You guys are fucked. And all you're worried about is if she's calling your phone. But then I checked myself for a second and I was like, of course she's so codependent because she's not receiving love from her family. Like her parents are so toxic and gross and do not provide that level of support for her. So of course she's looking for that. And like that explains why she just fell in love with her so quickly because she needed that. Mm -hmm. and that humbled me real fast. Yeah, I think at one point she says something like, oh, there was like a week or two that went by where the only things I said to my parents was just like, good morning and good night. Like, and I didn't ever talk to them ever besides that. Relatable. I, I, <laughs> I wrote the right things also, like, the things that she says didn't really match so much. Like, there's a point where she was like, um, I don't understand why mom is still with him. Like, why won't they divorce, blah, blah, blah. But then when they announced their divorce, she was like, oh, what? How could right. this be? I wrote down, I was like, are you dumb, bitch? <laughs> <laughs> I also think she could be, like, needing Amy because Amy, like, her and Amy are the only two to know that they set off this ritual and this is they're causing the end of the world. She's like, she's the only one that could potentially gang up with me and fix this shit. She can't tell her family. She does. But in the beginning era, she's like, I need Amy because she has answers, you know? Mm -hmm. I also think it was cool. Not cool, I guess, but interesting that she was like, the reason that they got together in the first place was because her dad was drunk on the front lawn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm school must accept amy and she was like so like thanks dad's alcoholism because it got me her yeah but right. what was it she was like she thought that the dad was dead and then she like kicked him and he's still he breathing was like, damn was it? Ugh, yeah yeah but if we want to go with gabby's point she could have been at her worst like seeing visibly that she has no dad and like embarrassed and all this and like conjured up this like savior girl who was like oh so bunny <gasps> so funny, funny. Yeah. oh my god now we just have to bring this back to wicked and we'll be good there we go <laughs> like the house of a thousand books truck i have a kind of a wild theory that i kind of just want to throw out there unless someone has something more interesting to share because this is going to derail us for sure well could i could i say something that i learned in the afterward so when he so i said in the beginning he wrote it as a screenplay first so he said when he wrote it first as a screenplay there was no supernatural elements to this at all. 
So there was no mm. Amy or any of that. Or I think Amy was in it, but I don't think there was any of that like demonic stuff. Which so, and then when he wrote it as a novella, he added that. And then when he rewrote it into the movie, he added that stuff into it as well. So do you, what I just want to know what you guys would have thought if it didn't have like the supernatural element. Well, I think it would have been a little more like like what Steven said, not predictable, but like what you would expect to where, yeah, all explainable by realism and like this all happened realistically. Um, I think the supernatural stuff and the confusion adds a layer of ambiguity that's fun. So I'm happy he changed that, I guess. If there wasn't Amy or like wasn't the supernatural, I think I just would have leaned harder into the no exit theory. Mm. Yeah. It would still be horrifying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just the dead physically being in the room makes it horrifying and tense. <laughs> but speaking of the dead, I have a theory that could be wild or could be spot on accurate. Just hear me out. I think the dad and the son are the same person. And here's why. First, the dad's name is Robert. The son's name is Bobby. Bobby is short for Robert. Two, but you know, dads often name their kids after- You literally have that name. I told you I was triggered by this book. I think- (laughs) A mirror. I guess I'm sparky then. I think I'm in it. You are sparky. Oh my God. (laughs) So they have the same name. Coincidence? Perhaps. Two- the dad shared that whole sentiment about how he got a pet snake as a nine-year-old that he didn't ask for. His mom just surprised him, happy birthday with the snake. And then one morning he woke up and he loved the snake and the snake was so nice to him. Snake went missing. Four days later, he wakes up. The snake is strangling him. And the mom comes in time just to barely save him and he survives. As we find out in the story, a snake finds its way into the bathroom. And who does it bite? The sun. So... The son gets injured by a snake. The dad was injured by a snake. The son gets poisoned by the snake. And it is that poison that kills him. And what is the dad doing the whole time they're in the bathroom? Ingesting poison. Alcohol wipes. Listerine. That's poison. You cannot ingest those things. He's so desperate. He starts to like being on the alcohol wipes and Listerine because he is going through withdrawals because at this point we don't know how many days have gone by. And the dad is going through withdrawal so bad that he, oh, yeah. they're in the bathroom. So they go in the medicine cabinet and they find all the different medicines that they can use yes. for many uh, different reasons. But yeah. the dad finds some alcohol wipes and like, yeah. sucks the alcohol out of them. Brings a bottle of Listerine. Goes blind. And he goes blind. It was not terrible. His alcoholism was really apparent. So it's pretty much presumed that he's also going to die of alcohol poisoning. So... I don't know. Too coincidental for me. Mm. It was super weird that he's telling the story of his childhood snake, which obviously, even if it survived, would be dead if he is now an an old man. Um, And then it just appears in the room and bites his son. I'm like, that's not the same snake, but also like, did you manifest that snake? Like, did it hear you? Did it pull up? I'm so confused. I thought the snake was maybe Satan, and that's what the girl summoned in the ritual. I wrote (laughs) Slewfoot. Uh, the snake was maybe coming for the daughter, but too coincidental that the dad had a pet snake. Mm-hmm. Also, I think I could be misremembering, but I think they just kind of just like gave up and it was just chilling there. Like they just stopped worrying about. No, the- they they lost it. And then they oh, were like, you okay. know what, maybe because they're like in the frenzy, maybe it went back out because they looked everywhere for it and they couldn't find it. Uh-uh. They, all fell asleep. They, will- they fell asleep with a snake in the room. Right. I don't believe that. Mm -mm. That shit was loose. The dad and the mom look for it. They look around. Oh, snake's not here. We're good to go. Two seconds later, I guess we forgot to look behind the toilet. This room is two feet by two feet. How did you not look everywhere? Like, how did they miss it? I think that's when the dad jumps on the sink or whatever because he's scared of the snake, right? Well, that's the first thing. They all fall asleep and they wake up. Um, and they yeah because he wakes up and his back is okay like, okay yeah because then the brother's like i have to pee so the mom and dad look around they're like oh the snake must have crawled out go pee you're safe they were surviving solely on water so obviously they were gonna have to pee a lot but there was so like you already said there was so much weird language why was he so obsessed with like farts and like <laughs> butts and all this stuff I was like, oh, yeah. yeah wait but going back to the snake real quick were you guys mad when they put the trash can over the snake after 
Bobby died. I was like, you couldn't have fucking done that in the first place. You nobody did anything. Ooh, they were infuriating. Logical or smart or effective. That's the name of the book. No, literally. Yeah. This is kind of going towards the very end, but throughout the or I mean the very end, like basically the last five pages. But throughout the entire book, I was like, okay, you know what? Sure. I read like a few things about this book and why people, some people rated it so low they're like oh they could take out the hinges on the door or whatever mm. I'm like well sometimes that's not visible especially because it's an out opening outward door like if you look at most of the doors the hinges are going to be on the opposite side um but i thought in my head i was like but if a tree fell a tree's trunk cannot or at least one at like a regular home shouldn't be the size of a door so i was like there has to be some part of the door exposed like why don't you just fucking break through it i know that dad can he did she, well the daughter says that at one point she's like dad can't you just punch the door down and he's like i can't fucking punch through a door and i wrote the note i'm sure you've had a ton of practice i think a i think either a they're too stupid to think of all this <laughs> stuff like the hinges and all that or b we just have to like suspend our disbelief that they tried everything or like everything that we we would have thought to do just wouldn't have worked like you're that's not kind of that's not the point yeah that's also not the point I just thought that was crazy I was like the one thing I thought that they would do and then the mom does it and then that's how it ends and like she comes back and she's like I, that would have been me <laughs> I think that they all should have like the dad should have died first and then when Bobby dies, the mom was like feral like my kid just died and like rust through the fucking door and gets them out like mm. it was kind of just like girl you waited till this long to figure out you could do that and now you're out come on I wanted all of them to just t- tag team and kill the dad. Yeah, it would have made their couple days in there easier. They would have had plenty to eat. <laughs> no one wants that freaking Listerine. Oh, it would be like a Thin Mint. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would think he would be like nice and like juicy with like the beer belly. Like it'd be tender. Tender as a flesh. I don't want to assume, but... I would I would assume that Max Booth the third does not have a great relationship with his father because it was just like just dead on balls accurate. All of it. The narcissism, the God complex, the I know everything, you're stupid. And like it was just spot on. They even said like that one where he's just losing his shit, he's banging against the wall and he's just screaming at no one in particular other than to just make himself be heard. And it's just how many times did I write manipulation down? I wrote every word in the book. I was like, narcissist, asshole, nihilist. Like, I just, every word in the book for this man. Wait, do you know what the, like, for some reason, like, the worst scene that sticks in my head, ironically, is when he's pushing Bobby out of the crack. <gasps> Ooh. Oh, my God. No, so... I wrote anxiety. I had to put the Ooh. book down. Like, I could really picture it. And I was like, this is fucking terrible. Oh yeah. My face hurt. You know what really hurt about that scene when he, when uh the narrator points out she looks over to the mom to stop it, but the mom's not doing anything because Loki the mom wants it to work too. Yes. She's just that desperate. She's like, fuck it, like push him through. I don't even care anymore if you break his skull. We need to do it. But that's her baby. Oh, that was a tough one. Yeah. I got like really confused about I feel like there was a like a while and I think it was when um the narrator was like telling the parents about the thing with Amy the son was like fully just like right there dead and they were just like having like a conversation like a family like like normal conversation in my head in the back of my head I was like no, your dead brother like right on the floor next to you I'm just happy that it was silent it is broke like that broke like yeah like no one was acting normal if we're thinking this like this actually happened taking it at face value being stuck alone in a windowless room for more than 24 hours would drive you nuts add in your toxic family and now your kid just died in front of you you're shut down you're not you're a shell yeah well not to victim blame we didn't really talk about her much but i just did not vibe with the mom like she was not i feel like she didn't do enough she didn't stand up enough i mean i don't think that's on her because the dad was obviously the real villain but i don't know i felt like she was at times just like meek and not effective and she she i will say too like she did say at one point too that she 
near the end that she's like, I was afraid of you of like what you would do about specifically about cheating. But I feel like that fear definitely existed in their relationship. So mm-hmm. I, well, I didn't really like her character either, but I feel like, um, I don't know. I just, it clearly was a very toxic relationship. So I understand it being a tough thing to kind of get out, especially when you have two kids with someone, but one now. One. <laughs> yeah, one. True. Yeah, I still felt for her. Uh, I felt I felt bad for her. Was frustrated with her, absolutely. But this man was such a monster. Mm-hmm. Like, it's absolutely insufferable to be with. And just, like, he's also spiraling, right? Not only is he just an asshole in general sense, he's also going through withdrawals. Yeah. So, like, he is 12. Yeah, he's, like, and... not safe to be around. <laughs> and just, like, violent. No. And they're literally... In- there's no escaping him. They're in close quarters and they're defenseless. Well, my other question is more of a like a statement, just to see if any of you guys picked up on this. I started to notice that they kept using baby, just the word baby a whole ton. And then like birth became a really apparent thing that didn't necessarily seem relevant to me. A lot of them was like the brother was the sister was calling the brother, you're just being such a baby. The mom was calling the son, oh, come here, my baby. I love you, my baby. The dad was being like, oh, grow up. You're you're acting like a baby. And it just kept getting thrown around over and over again. She was like, I wish you would just have a drink because you're acting like a fucking baby. Like, just shut up. And it just was so in my face. And then the brother kept asking the mom, can you tell me the story of how I was born in that Walmart? Right, and right. It up like two or three times. And I was like, what is it? with birth and baby like why is this recurring so often it has to mean something and did you notice i highlighted this because uh it is on at least for the ebook it's on page 72 it says bobby sprawled out on his back between his mom's legs head resting on her thigh as she pets his hair that's like the birthing position Ooh, yeah right and like why was that his birth story relevant I thought maybe at first it was just because the first time it gets mentioned, it's like, oh, like, where were you, dad? And it's like, oh, he right. Where he was. So I thought that was the point of that. But then when it kept coming up, I wasn't really sure. It was just the term baby was overused. And by this author, I would assume intentionally it was not an accident. And I just want to know why. That's my question. I don't have an answer. All right. Someone DM him. Also, I think the dad was gay. No, once you pointed that out. <laughs> I have to throw that out there. Why are these your two? Wait, so your your plot points are Bobby and the dad are the same, but also the dad is gay. Yeah, that is true. Great. I think the dad <laughs> was. I have evidence. They talk about, well, Bobby's just like scaring his family being like, maybe it's aliens. I watched a YouTube video um, where aliens came down and like shoved things up people's butts. And the dad clenches his jaw and shakes his head and says, any goddamn alien tries that shit with me, I'll break their fucking necks, and that's a promise. Ain't nobody putting nothing up my ass. And I wrote my note here. Oh, okay, so he's DL Hungry Bottom on Grinder. <laughs> 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 that was like projecting. And then it comes up again when they're going to eat the tongue. Like he was like, oh, food? Okay, I'll eat the tongue. I, I'm so desperate, I would eat his dick if I had to. And I was like, of course you want a dick in your mouth. Oh, wow. I forgot about that. It happened twice, and I'm not saying that's a lot, but it's just a coincidence it happened twice. I believe that theory more than the kid and the dad being the same person. Truthfully. I love that theory, though, kid and dad being the same. I do, too. Listen, I don't know. Them all dying by poison yeah. feels too correct. And the snake parallel also. I like that theory a lot. Maybe like Bobby is all the good and the kid and the naivety of the dad that the mom is holding on to. And that's why she cares for him so much or something. I don't know. But it's interesting. Oh. If there's a parallel between the dad and the son do you think there's a parallel between the mom and mel whoa they're all just each other i mean i will say in in mel's relationship with amy she does seem to be that kind of like more just like submissive Mm, she does follow really whatever amy does want to do like amy's the one who wanted to do the spell amy's both times 
Wow. And Amy's talking about this like mental illness she has, whereas the father's an addict. Yeah, that was nuts. And it definitely is a real thing. I heard, I was familiar with the term when she said it, but like really reading the explanation of like people fully, like it's a phenomenon that people believe they died. Like there was a point where their life ended and they are just continuing on like in some other form of themselves. And it is a real phenomenon that people experience and haven't like fully subscribed to, which is so fascinating to me. I'm kind of into it. <laughs> yeah, it's another, it's another example of, is she dead and a ghost and supernatural? Or is it, she's mentally ill and thinks she's dead you know it's it can go either way with every single thing explained in this book can i just read the sentiment about the parents that i just Definitely. really want to share please do um it's not even remotely re- relevant to what we were talking about but it's just yeah this book hit she just says um like just talking about the mom what could she have possibly ever have seen in him nothing about his characters even seemingly remotely appealing i've never seen them even laugh together i've never seen them engage each other in conversation concerning each other's interests come to think of it i don't even think they have any interests dad goes to the bowling alley and drinks and mom she what spends time online what a fucking read meeting her boyfriend Oof. oh and talking to her boy toy <laughs> it's it, i think that was also to show that also, the kids don't know their mom at all. Relatable. Mm. But I said, read. <laughs> oh, my God. The the check boxes you have, you're crazy. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I just come here with a freaking water and a dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That was good. My water and a dream. We want to start descending into the madness of the finale. Mm-hmm. please i just want to say how quickly it turned i mean the whole thing was ambiguous and like you're not sure what's real or anything but it went from like oh everything is not what it seems <laughs> was this way really place? <laughs> to like fever dream like 180 whiplash it is fever dream and i think like bobby dying the, the little brother dying really sends it over the edge I have here tabbed with the first mom. I was like, oh, this is so fever dreamy. She's like, Bobby can't possibly be talking because Bobby's dead. He's a corpse. He reaps of decay. It's just the three of us now. Bobby died. Bobby died. And he's not coming back. No, that can't be right. Why would Bobby be dead? Where am I right now? Yeah. Super unreliable. I took it as just yeah. like uh, insanity from this going on for too long and trying to process all this stuff. Not so much any sort of theory or like timeline change or anything it was more just like the literal she's going mad yeah this is also like the time where they mostly i guess only her really just really start to question the timelines of things she was like oh and then the snake's gonna come no wait that happened already that did was it? crazy mm-hmm. and then i was like that did it happen already i don't know like all of those mm-hmm. events just started to get mixed up and it went like we kept going on that there there was no resolution uh-huh. i mean i think that at that point in the book that's when it really started to feel like i forget what you called it gabby it just kind of keeps looping oh um, basically the the play no exit yeah like that's what it felt like and like i've seen a few like horror movies like that where it's yeah it's like this timeline that just keeps replaying even if you die so then I feel like she, she, at that point, it seemed like she was just getting confused with where she was in the in the story that she, maybe somewhere she knows what's happening, like what happens. Yeah, my theory was that they it was going to like the end of the book was going to allude to how it was in the beginning. And like they're like walking into the bathroom for some reason. Yeah, mm-hmm. I thought that too. I can think of some like cheesier plots where like they relive everything again, but like it's a little bit off or, you know, that I we all have seen that kind of. Mm, one of those. I thought that there was a part where, like, she's reliving the beginning again. She is. She totally is. That first line comes back and her phones are screaming. She does. Our phones won't stop screaming. Yep, that's page on the ebook 169. I highlighted that, too. Wait, what? Oh. Right back to the beginning. Totally. So maybe it is a loop. Oh, I did not pick that up. I didn't pick that up either. Yeah, our phones won't stop screaming, each slightly out of sync with each other, making the noises jarring and insane. We form a line and pile. What chapter is this? Is this in chapters? No, it was one long stream of consciousness. It was right after this page. 
Whoa, cool. That was from the, the spell book, yeah. Or the, the spell PDF. From Reddit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That felt really real. When they were talking about Reddit, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. I tried to do this kind of thing, I'd be on Reddit, too. I was reading one of the people's takes on it on Reddit, because um, that's always my go-to search. And he commented, like, hey, thanks. And they were like, holy shit, what? And it's just like, Max Booth III, his Reddit name. That's crazy. <laughs> Like on this small little horror novel Reddit page that I follow. Okay. I was like, of course, he loves Reddit. Like, no wonder. I mean, that checks out. <laughs> oh my God. I have a wicked reference. No <laughs> way. way. I'm dead. No when way. The and he's like, he's calling his wife a witch. And he's like, you two are witches. And he's screaming out the door. He's like, help. We need to kill the witch. <laughs> We need to kill the witch. I wrote Act Two of Wicked. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. Always a wicked reference. <laughs> it always comes back. Wow. Is that right before his death? He's like that's his like max freakout moment. Um yeah. It might have been. Also, can we say how insane that one of the last sentences is? What is it? Mom's face is a shredded mess from the snake whippings. How insane of a sentence is that? Oh my god, he takes oh my god, he whips her with the snake. Yeah. I forgot about that. Well, because he gets bit by the snake, doesn't he? Dad, yeah. Yeah. Does he also? She unleashes it on him. Oh yes. Yes, he does. Proving your theory. He ripped oh my god. The snake bites his face and he won't stop screaming. No, not screaming. He's laughing. He's fucking laughing. Yeah. He's losing it. They're all losing it. Steph, that's your summary. They're all losing it. <laughs> You're losing me. <laughs> he is the son. I'm telling you. And he's whipping the mom, chanting, kill, kill the witch. <laughs> yeah. yeah! <laughs> what a visual. <laughs> God. Well, we don't need to visualize because we can watch it. Oh, God. Do you think they're going to have a whiplash or a <laughs> snake lashing? Hey, they only had to pay for one set. They better have all the stunts. Seriously. That's true. <laughs> okay, I want to ask way toward the end. Father's dead. Mother has had it. She breaks out. She leaves. Did anyone A, think that the daughter was creating that in her mind and that no one actually left? Or B, think that the mom was going to leave her ass there? <laughs> I was like... I was like, I would be long gone, girl. I don't even care. Wait, that's so funny. I didn't know what to think, but that's really funny. I thought maybe she's just going to go get help if there was help. And yeah, I thought this would give us a reveal of what the fuck is actually outside this door. And that, like, you know, oh, like those endings of the movies where it's like aliens took over and that's when they discover it or whatever. Like something's going to happen. But all we get is she comes back all bloody and distraught. That's it. <laughs> When she left, I didn't know what to think next because at, at that point I was like, okay, this book is unpredictable. Like what? Like mm. I have no clue what's going to happen. But yeah, that ending. <sighs> I thought it was a hallucination only because of this one line here on page 114 of the ebook. When she like comes to, because she like keeps coming in and out of consciousness because they're just so weak at this point. The first line she says is, I think mom thinks I'm dead. And I don't know if she's wrong. Mm. Just like Amy. And that's when the mom breaks through the door. So maybe she died in that moment. And yeah, she is living as her dead body. I don't know. She's in limbo. Or she imagined her coming back for her and she's actually dead. Yeah, I mean, because we, we didn't really talk about the, the NyQuil either. Oh, she chugs the NyQuil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When does she drink the lean? <laughs> yeah, she chugs that. Okay, sorry. We're getting all this completed. The one thing I did want to say about the dad right before he died, we mentioned it before, but he answers her phone. Yes. Who is he talking to? I assumed Amy, because I'm like, who else would be calling Mel? He says, this is what he says. He says, yes, of course. Yes. No. I understand. Yes, of course. Oh. It sounds like an authority. And he tosses her phone back out the door. Right. Yeah. Breaks it in half and throws it. Yeah. He, would, he wouldn't, like, it sounds like an authority figure or a man, at least. 
But who's calling Mel? You're right. Well, yeah, her phone's ringing. She said, someone's calling me. It's Amy. But she doesn't know that. She doesn't ever see her phone. She just assumes it's Amy. Yeah, but no, I'm just saying that in general, who's calling Mel at this time? Like, who is that? And why would that be his answer? Why wouldn't he be like, get us out? Hello, we're stuck. Yeah. I don't know. And it was such a demeanor change. He just went from aggressive, aggressive, and he answers the phone. Yep. Okay. So weird. Sure. I understand. Like, what? Kill the witch. Kill the witch. No, yeah, the snapping the phone and just throwing it back out. I yeah, that was ridiculous. Oh, and then I highlighted he starts slowly crawling because oh the way even right now <laughs> my spine just tingled. I can't. Crawling is the worst. Yeah, through vomit and blood and shit and piss. A lunatic smile carved across his face. It makes sense, doesn't it? Oh. Ugh. Also, I just want to point out, according to my notes, between page 95 and 96, they say the word baby eight times. Just saying. That's really weird. I want to, yeah, we need to ask the author. My final thing is, the way my audio or my ebook was set up, because I zoom in, it perfectly lined up that the mom crawled back in and said, and I turned the page just to see the one solid block of text saying, it's going to be okay. Oh, how scary. Wait, can you show can you show Steph and I how it looks? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because it looks different on mine, too. Like, it starts in the middle. Yeah. Mine starts, like, right at the end of the page. The audiobook just repeats and repeats and repeats. Yeah. Oh, damn. Whoa. Whoa. That's perfect. That's yeah. cool. Damn. And I gasped. Did the audiobook say all of those? A couple, I think. You said it for, like... Definitely not three pages worth of <laughs> an amount to make like me get chills. Yeah. Wow. Because it's also fast. It's like it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be yeah. That's oh how yeah. It God. gets like yeah. It gets more insane. I did not like it. I the didn't. way I would have lost sleep for days. I was so unsettled. I sat with the book. I like sat, I put the, my ebook down and like sat for like a solid sixty seconds. I was just like. Oh unsettled enough that i couldn't move now you guys understand in the group chat i was like guys we have to talk about this right <laughs> away <laughs> so what what do we think she encountered when she came back all bloody who the fuck knows and i think that's a very eric laroca thing like you said ian reed eric laroca like sometimes the unknown is scarier yeah yeah it could be something as simple as literally like she found the dead dog or she got a cut i don't know but weird 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 if there, if we're going the scenario that there is things outside of the house, I don't know. I just picture it like a really just messed up world at that point. Like, cause just the evidence we have of this man dog, um, mm-hmm. this other guy who gets like just like mowed down with a machine gun. Like mm-hmm. that was giving like the government stepping in during an apocalypse. Like, yeah, you know? I yeah, thought like so... monsters or something got released. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was jarring, though. He was like, and then the sound of machine guns. I was like, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah. That, was, that part was really left field. All of it was really left field. And in their house? Right, yeah. Like, why would it come to their house and shoot someone up? I don't know if it was in their house. I thought it was just, like, off in the distance. Nearby, yeah, nearby. Yeah. Could have just been out on the street. Any final thoughts? Well, I I just have one last thing that I learned from the afterward, which was that right. I feel like it put a lot of things into perspective for this story after we, especially after we get the ending. But I, um, this was written during or maybe right before the pandemic, I think, or I think the screenplay, the first screenplay was written before the pandemic, and then the novella was created like during the pandemic. Wow, I didn't think so. I feel that. like that that really had a big impact on this for sure. Like, um. Max Booth also talks in it about how at that time he was working overnight shifts in a hotel in Texas where people didn't wear masks, like all this stuff, like people were getting laid off left and right. Um, and he was just like at that time at a very like um, not like secure place, I guess. Um, so I feel like that like those themes are like very definitely present in this Um Especially, I just thought that that ending was really cool how it's like, I don't know, I, I kind of read it like, well, after the pandemic ended, we all go back out to the world. But then it's like, do we come back into our homes being like, no, 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 you know what I mean? Like, 
um forgetting like how, the same. trying to convince ourselves that everything's okay yeah right um or or just like realizing the world that we had left behind and then coming back into it and being scared of that um so i thought that that was really cool it made me appreciate the book more reading that i would definitely recommend reading that mm, no i really want to buy this book i want to support this author mm-hmm that is a very interesting added layer, I think. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and I mean, just like everything of like the isolation and being trapped mm-hmm. with your family. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. It is very COVID-y. <laughs> <Kobe-y. Yeah. laughs> um, Someone on some of the, one of the reviews I saw brought up a point that I'm not sure if I like vibe, like I don't, I don't think I go with it too much, but they were suggesting that maybe this like the demon the ritual all of this was a metaphor for amy's sexuality amy's sexuality i mean amy and uh the daughter and mel's relationship yeah yeah mel not being accepted by her family like they're like trapped and coming out of the not the closet but the door i don't know it was this whole summary of someone thinking that and i'm just curious is anyone did anyone get that at all because i didn't really get that but i mean i could see it kind of gonna say it's interesting that you say that because the whole book, just the type of character that the father was, I was wondering if that was an aspect to it. Like, I was wondering if it was a secret. But then, like, it's... I You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure at the end, like, he's talking about, like, oh, your girlfriend, Amy. Like, he's saying it like he already knew about her, I thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so then I was like, oh, maybe, like, that isn't a part of it, but... Okay, yeah. That is an interesting theory. Yeah, when she was first being like, I need to get my phone so no one else sees because if they see what's on my phone, like they're going to hate me or they're going to see me differently Mm -hmm. and they're going to find out eventually, but like this isn't the way I wanted to find out. Like whatever, however it was worded, I assumed she was like, oh, she probably like has like I love you texts or something that she doesn't want like her parents finding out about yet. Mm -hmm. And then that further supports my theory that the dad's gay and projecting his insecurities. And it runs on the family. Classic. Maybe they're all the dad. Oh God! <laughs> Everyone is the dad. Everyone is the dad. What a horrible take. <laughs> no. Well, I wish we had a better way to wrap up the story, but that's not how this story goes. So I think we get right into ratings. Yeah. Who wants to start? I mean, five stars, baby girl. Um, this is a book that I'm going to be recommending to everyone who asks if they could quick or pick up a quick book or if they want to read something horror I think this is a really good book to just to throw at people (laughs) well so it's interesting because I don't know I feel like so I read it quick I was reading it very quickly um because I wanted to read it right before the discussion so I feel like that kind of I mean this is a quick read but I at when I finished it I hadn't really had a chance to like digest my thoughts I feel like so I was actually planning to give this a four surprisingly what wow Brody yes yes that's like a one in his book (laughs) (laughs) um but I'm happy to announce that after discussing it um I would I would give it a five a reluctant five um I am going to give it a three I um it was a pretty run of the mill book for me. Um I definitely just kept the narrative that they really were going through some kind of natural disaster almost like with the whole tree and everything and they really were stuck in the family and I just yeah I just saw them just slowly slip into madness. Um I didn't read it physically. I listened to it on many different varieties of speed and in different places. Like some of it I read like on my own. Some of them I read like on a train, on a bus. So I also think that that might have like deterred me from really gaining like all, like like hearing all of the details. Um, I, yeah, but I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. It's a solid three. Yeah, kind of similarly, I did when I was solely audioing it, I like was kind of I could be doing other stuff or not. Like I didn't feel I didn't have the same experience as Brody where it's like you're reading it in one go and you're kind of 
speeding through it so it's like you're living it with them you're feeling isolated you're so engrossed in the story so the parts that I read along with the audio I like remember more and like felt it more and so I came into this giving it a three but I'm bumping it to a four because the convo we've had has made me realize like number one it's short enough for me like I could read it physically again and see if that changes things but also just I gave it a three because I don't like ambiguity in books a lot and I don't like the bunny no answer figure this out yourself I like because because I can make up endings but it's not like canon to what the author is telling me is what went down so I'm always like no I need you to tell me what happened so for that reason I felt like unsatisfied so I gave it a three but now yeah our discussion and thinking back on a lot of the stuff and how it could go either way throughout the whole book but that's kind of the point and so he did that well so I gave it four solid I'm also giving her a strong five stars. I really loved it. I think I kind of said at the beginning, it felt like the perfect love child of Eric LaRocca and Ian Reed. And I was blown away by the writing. I thought the writing was incredible. The story was just weird enough, just out there enough that I was sucked in. The real life horrors of being locked in close quarters with your family was terrifying to me then you threw in like the twists of it being a ritualistic apocalyptic questionable of timeline it just pushed enough that i was sold and not to mention all the shock like the shock value was perfect the eating of the tongue the killing of the little brother oh yeah i definitely definitely will be picking up more max booth the third in the future Wait, I just realized because you said about um the son being named after the dad, Max Boot the Third, he was named after his dad. Yep. (laughs) Sorry to read you, Max (laughs) Booth. So thank you so much for listening to another episode of House of Thousand Books. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. I hope you had a chance to read. We need to do something. If you haven't still by the end of this, please go pick it up. Um, next month we are going to be reading Near the Bone by Christina Henry it should be a nice winter tale for us to read Inside in the Cold thank you so much for listening have a great night (laughs) 